episode of Outside the Rack is brought to you by Kinetic Performance, the makers of the Gym Aware. In today's world of strength and conditioning, data collections become the utmost of importance, and that's exactly where Gym Aware separates itself from the competition. Because when we're sitting there and looking to collect data, what data are you actually collecting? And are the numbers you're looking at fitting into the exercises that you're utilizing? And even more so, are they going to answer the questions that you're looking for? Looking at different ways that you are moving the barbell through peak and mean, both velocity and power, is really what separates gym aware from the competition. Being able to understand what your ballistic exercises are doing separate to what your strength exercises are doing really allows you to program at a much more specific level for your athletes. So hop on over to kinetic.com.au to see what Evan and his team have in store for you today. The world of strength and conditioning is filled with some fantastic practitioners that are always searching for more. But more what? What are strength and conditioning coaches searching for to better their ability to prepare their athletes? Well, what about cutting edge information or a place where you can find different opinions from forward thinking coaches on what you're doing, how you're doing, and try to get feedback to be better for your athletes? Or what about a place where you'll find like-minded coaches that can provide solid coaching advice and career development for you as you progress through your career as a strength and conditioning professional? Well, this is exactly why we built the Strength Coach Network. You'll have access to exclusive monthly content on top of the sensationally active forum that we have where you can communicate with coaches all over the world to find those answers that you're looking for to help you be a better practitioner for your athletes. So make sure you hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS, that's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS, and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the 20th episode of Outside the Rack, brought to you by Kinetic Performance, the makers of Gym Aware. In this show, we're just going to try to dive a little deeper into the minds of some of the top practitioners in the world of sport performance to learn a little bit more about who they actually are and how they got to where they are today. Today, we are joined by Donskoff Strength and Conditioning Incorporated's Anthony Donskoff. Anthony, thanks for being with us, brother. Hey, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. But before we get rolling too far into this, man, who is Anthony Donskoff? Sure. Um, so uh, I am a strength coach that resides in Columbus, Ohio. I'll give you a footnote version of kind of how I got where I am today. Uh, I was born and raised in, in Canada, so I'm a dual citizen. We moved to the States when I was approximately 14 years old. Hockey's always been a huge uh, passion of, our, of mine, of our families. Had the opportunity to go and, and, and play university hockey at Miami of Ohio and Oxford, Ohio. Um, believe it or not, my undergrad at that time was in business, which I don't regret. I think it's something that uh, actually I'm real proud of and I use every day. I uh, had the opportunity to play a few years of, of, of minor professional hockey after my career at, at Miami. Um, and I found out uh, through my experience at Miami in the weight room, uh, we had a coach, uh, Dan Darimple, who's now actually the head strength coach for the New Orleans Saints, um, that I, I was really passionate about the preparation process. Uh, so when I uh, was done playing uh, pro hockey, I, I, I pursued a, a master's degree in exercise science, started a small business. We're now in a 3,000 square foot footprint. I'm aging myself now. We're going on 16 years in business, which is uh, Actually, I'm very proud of as a small business owner and then uh, pursuing my PhD now, University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada. So that's me to this present date. I love it, man. And a guy who's been changing where he's going and learning from some of the top minds in the world. Yeah. You're an inquisitive dude who's <laughs> run up and down a lot of different rabbit holes. So if you wouldn't mind starting out with number one, brother, if you could describe for us a learning situation that brought about an epiphany in Anthony's career? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, a fantastic question. I'd like to answer it if I could in two parts. Uh, one more of a broad braced shotgun type answer and the other one more of a rifle approach. So more of a targeted approach in, in epiphanies. I think the first one to answer very broadly, uh, I think a lot of the colleagues that have been in this business long enough could relate to me that the older you get, the more questions you have unanswered. Um, you know, the more your dialogue change from, from changes from, of course, of absolutely, certainly to I don't know, perhaps, maybe context dependent. So for me, as I've aged as a coach, 
I live in cognitive dissonance. I have competing theories in my brain. I think I, I try to question what I'm doing. I try to poke holes in what I'm doing. Something that if you asked me 10 years ago, I'd tell you, absolutely not. You know, here's the answer. It's black. It's white. So that would be one that is much more broad based of an epiphany as I've aged. I think that has to happen just from my experience. It's happened with experience, something you have to grow into. And if you stay in the business long enough, I, I believe it naturally happens. Um, the other one is a more of a rifle approach. Epiphany for me uh, was really in programming, and this was many uh, years back, so probably uh, four or five years ago. Um, there's been some individuals that have had some drastic impacts on the way I look at planning. Um, John Kiley wrote an article called 21st Century Periodization, which I think is like, probably one of the best articles ever written on periodization that completely reframed a paradigm I had on planning. And then I looked a little bit deeper um, into a, a few other individuals, uh, Mladen Jovanovic and uh, Dan Pfaff, and how they programming. And the epiphany for me really was let the micro dictate the macro. And when you're looking at planning, uh, you know, I used to look at models and think that they were so fantastic and so awesome. And I could quote you the book and then I'd try to fit a model on a reality that just didn't, they didn't align. Um, so I think what these practitioners really opened my eyes to is that you've got to look at your unique reality and then you've got to find a model. All are wrong. Some are really wrong. And you've got to fit your reality, your constraints, your athletes, your resources, uh, your coaching acumen into that model. And then you've got to have error elimination, KPIs, and then it's always subject to change. It's always subject to have iterations. Um, but that dictates uh, uh, how you plan. And that was a huge eye opener for me because the reality was I never looked at, at planning with that kind of uh, a vision. Does that make sense? No, a thousand percent. I think like, especially today's day and age where the whole idea of reverse engineering your sport has become more of a sexy thing. I think all too often people want to look at the macro, like mm -hmm. the whole big picture, instead of being like, this is where I know we need to go. What do I need to do right now? To make sure. sure that we're moving that way. And then all this other stuff after it can get tweaked and turned and all those things. But like, if you don't take care of where you're standing, who sure. cares where your fifth step is? Yeah. And I always say too, with reverse engineering, I kind of equate it to driving a car. Like if you want to know where you're going, you better look through the windshield. If you're constantly looking through the rear view, you, you don't have your eyes on the road. And other individuals that really had a, an impact on me uh, for this line of thinking had nothing to do, but yet everything to do with strength and conditioning. Gerd Gigerenser, he had a book called Risk Savvy, and then uh, Nazim Nicholas Talab, uh, who wrote many books, The Black Swan, Anti-Fragile, et cetera. And in it, he, he posed an analogy that's kind of creative that make, made me think, he called it the reverse engineering problem. It's much more difficult to forecast an ice cube from a puddle of water than it is a puddle of water from a melting ice cube. So I'll let you sit on that one. And that'll make you think a little bit about how you plan. And again, it is context dependent. I think it should be noted to the listeners that we have a, a private facility. I don't have four years with an athlete. I have 12 to 16 weeks with an athlete. So that's the lens I look through when I program. And these people had a profound impact on the way that we do that. No, but I dig it because I don't think it matters so much as to whether it's four weeks, four days, four years, or a full lifetime. Like, Again, like understanding the present and that the present has to be done to a certain standard and level and to, in order to get to things that are going to come later. Like who cares what's going to be later yep. again if, if the present isn't taken care of? That's right. And we let, we use that present model. Again, this is a highly uh, Dan Pfaff and Stu McMillan. We use that, that, uh, that micro essentially like, there's really few working parts and it's literally that same micro. Yes. The loading changes slightly. Yes. The lifting lifts change slightly. That dictates our entire summer. So it was a really big paradigm shift for me, um, on the way that we uh, view programming, uh, prior to these, uh, to these individuals and their, and their knowledge. I love it, brother. And I'm stoked for this next question because <laughs> an author, a coach, a guy who's changed his educational background, a guy who's working on his PhD, a dude who questions every single last thing that he does, I can't wait to hear this. If you could ask just one question, Anthony, and you know you're going to get the answer, what would Anthony ask and why would he ask that? Gosh, it's that's, that's such a great question and it's a tough question. Obviously, 
my brain right now and my passion is a, a mix of, of uh, obviously the, the performance aspect and then, and then the performance aspect on the ice, hockey. That's the sport I'm the most passionate about. So I'm not cheating the question, but I'd probably break it into two for me right now in my brain. What off-ice abilities correlate strongest to skating abilities for elite hockey players? And the literature is mixed on this. Uh, some moderate to strong correlation, some very weak. The other one I think would be even just as interesting is what on-ice abilities correlate strongest to the skill of actually playing the sport itself, hockey? Um, those are two questions that keep me up at night. That would be really cool to have an answer. But like everything else, um, you know, uh, it, you just get closer to the truth as time evolves. There's never uh, – it would be, be kind of cool to have those answers, but uh, in my lifetime – I think if we had some something that measured that and, and, and predicted it strongly would satisfy me. I love that second one because yeah. it's outside of what we would typically dive into. Because yep. if you're thinking about that, right, that would just be one of those things that most of us would say, well, I mean, that's just a skill question. That's a sport coach question. But like how much does this thing that we as hockey players have spent so much time developing you know your power skating courses back in the early 90s when that came hot and yeah. people bringing in figure skating techniques to understand better ways to to find edges in that nature but how important is just the skill of skating to coming back and being the best player yeah absolutely critical i mean if you can't skate you can't play and the game's a really unique game and, and there's been some great research um unfortunately the biomechanical research in hockey is is sparse wish there was more of that uh, but there's there's some really really smart practitioners right now that are taking and collecting uh some fantastic data and uh um it is a question that uh, certainly uh certainly keeps me up at night would be really cool to have a, a better answer on that's for sure i love it dude i love it but listen man you do a lot and you're going to school, you know, you're helping all of us be better. You're putting out some of the best Twitter posts like <laughs> of the day when you're talking about the young strength coaches, y'all need to follow them if you have it, because those are great. Um, but you do do a lot. You give back a lot. You're trying to be better for yourself as well with the education. You're writing another book that we're going to talk about here after this answer. But how do you come back to neutral, bro? Like what's your escape? Oh, that's another good question. I think for me, uh, probably the two biggest escapes aside from, I'd say first, aside from family, uh, I have a, um, very, very close with my family, uh, two brothers and I've got a niece and a nephew and I love spending time with them. That's, uh, that makes that, that definitely is, is a, is a passion of mine and, and something I love to do, but I'd probably say the two biggest are poetry. I love to write poetry. Um, and I like to write music, uh, those things I keep coming back to and they clear my mind and recharge my battery. And he loves to write books that are going to help all of us be better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I started a project. It was, um, just kind of a passion of mine. I wrote a, a first book called physical preparation for ice hockey. And in it, it was really about how we, um, um, from a holistic standpoint, train our young youth players, uh, everything from power development, acceleration, uh, you know, constructing the strength and conditioning program and the physiology and underpinnings behind each. But this book, I, I, I was asked to speak a few years back at the NSCA Hockey Clinic, and um, this, uh, this talk inspired the book. But I wanted to put something pen to paper on how we train our high caliber players because there are distinct differences. Um, and, uh, which was kind of the birth of this, this new project called, uh, physical preparation for ice hockey, uh, part two, the gain, go grow manual, and then it's programming for high caliber players. So it's really about how we, uh, view, uh, the training process for elite hockey players. And it's also a combination of critical thinking, making decisions under uncertainty. Um, and it's just our hypothesis at the time, always subject to change. Well, we got to make sure that we got all that linked up, Ant, because I'm sure that this, just like the first one, man, above and beyond everything, it's going to make people take a step back and think. And I think that, you know, every time we talk, that's kind of what it's come back to is that helping people talk, helping guide discussion, helping make people go, hmm, a little bit is really yep. the driving factor behind all the great stuff that you're putting out, brother. We're lucky to have a dude like you in the field, man, who's really 
trying to push us all to be better. I'm truly grateful for your time. As always, it's great to chop it up, buddy, and look forward to talking again soon. Thanks so much for having me, Jay. Continued success, my friend. Yeah, man. You as well. Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay.